We do have a tremendous opportunity this afternoon. Many of you who listen to Catholic Radio know that one of the interactive ways that Catholic Radio engages its audiences is through call-in shows where people call in and ask their questions. We're going to have the opportunity in a certain sense to do that in a live format with Dr. Ray Grendy and Father Larry Richards with us here today. If you've been using Slido 3857, you have been asking questions and you also have been voting on questions for these two brother, brothers of ours to reflect upon and to uh, give us their thoughts. So what an opportunity uh, that is. You can continue to do so throughout today's presentation, continue to ask questions uh, as they come to you. We also have uh, a stack and a list here of written questions uh, that have been presented to us. So, Dr. Ray, Father Larry, come on out. Round of applause. We're going to share. You're the, uh, you're the uh, test, think I'm test on. one, too. Am I on? I don't think yeah. we need you on. I, think we I don't know, think we I mean, need you no, on. No, we need me on. <laughs> what? Oh, I'm so sorry. You hurt your hand. Did you? Yeah, I hit him in his head. It really hurt my hand. <laughs> the first question being asked is to Dr. Ray. Dr. Ray, did you give that man's quarterback? <laughs> Where is he? Where is the dude? Over there, over there. I bet you bent it, right? I bent it. Yeah, I bent it in half. Okay. First question, gentlemen. I'd like to hear your approach on how to educate and talk to young men on how to deal with a world that shames masculinity. How do we educate and talk to young men about masculinity. It's a nice narrow question, isn't yeah, exactly. it? exactly. You can start. Can't we do a potty training? No. <laughs> you see what I got to put up with? Go I'm ahead. I'm the spiritual before picture. We, I know, absolutely. What do you think, doctor? I'm a shrink. I got to get inside their heads. Okay. I got to ask them questions. I got to know how they think. I got to know what it is, the obstacle. I want to know their myths and their misperceptions about what it means to be a man. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to take you along where I want you to go, but you're not even going to know I'm taking you there because I'm asking you questions and I'm not lecturing you. Wow. Very good. Yeah. My, pass that. Ask that. <laughs> My big thing is men are always learning. Boys are learning. So first of all, they're going to learn what they see, right? So first of all, from their own father, we all need mentors. You know, the, I think the biggest crisis in society today is a father crisis. You know, that there, there is no fathers, and there's not even good examples to be fathers. And whenever you turn on the news or you watch any kind of soap opera, they make fathers look like baboons, right? So there is none of that. So we got to go back, and we got to learn what it is for our own self, and then we got to give this example. And again, you do it in the example of your personality, but... Uh, in my experience in dealing with boys in all these years, again, that's why I wrote my Be A Man book, is they want to be loved. They just do. And we got to love them with a strong love, not a wimpy love. That means we love them with a love that's more concerned about them than it is about ourselves. Huh? Like, again, that I think that but the biggest thing I used to say to my boys, I'd say, gentlemen, the biggest thing I can teach you to be a man is that everything you do has a consequence. Because society tries to get rid of consequences, does it not? You want to have sex with your wife, but no baby. You know, like once a kid came to me and says, Father, um, he was all upset. And I go, what's the matter? He goes, there was a mistake. And I said, what was the mistake? My girlfriend's pregnant. I said, son, that wasn't a mistake. That's what happens when you have sex with somebody. Someone gets pregnant, right? But see, we want to cut off any kind of stuff. You don't work here, we'll give you money as a society. You don't want to do anything, we'll help you. Don't worry about it. So there's no consequences for actions. And there's people our age that don't want consequences for actions. So they never grow up. So one of the things we teach them is everything you do has a consequence. Especially what we do with God. It has an eternal consequence. So we got to make sure teaching boys consequences. My son Peter 
went to a Catholic high school, he played basketball. Before the games, in front of all his boys, I'd kiss him. Now I'm Italian. We kiss That's you, you're why. a dead yeah, man. Yeah. Okay? You know what he told me later? He said, you know, Dad, I had several boys come up to me and say, I wish my father did that. Exactly. Why would you want their father to kiss you, Pete? <laughs> What is uh, one practical way that you would encourage the men at this conference to be an evangelist? What's one practical way that they can be evangelists and sharing the faith with others? Okay, my big thing is, well, I love, I love to give a whole talk on this, but there's three well, things. Well, you can't because I'm Shut up here up. and I get Shut part Shut up. Of it. No, you don't. First thing is you got to start a prayer list of people of praying for them. So your sons, your daughters, neighbors, whatever, pray for them. Because when you pray for somebody, you become a spiritual magnifying glass. And if, like, the sun is out today and you take a magnifying glass, the, gray, the, the rays of the sun get focused through that magnifying glass and set them on fire. When you pray, you become the spiritual magnifying glass. And if you want it to go to the next level, you fast. And then you, the intensity of God's grace, which is everywhere, will be focused through you to the person you're praying for. You do that first. The second thing you do is you love these people because we never judge anyone into the faith. It just doesn't work. You know, I try it. I come on strong when I'm doing a big group like this because I need to kick some of you in the butt. But one-on-one, -on -one, when I'm dealing with people, it's an altogether different reality normally. First, you pray for them. Then you love them. And then the third thing you do is you witness to them. And witness is altogether different than preaching. It's this is what Jesus has done for me, and this is what Jesus can do for you. But you got to remember one thing. you got to keep all these things in order and... You got to make sure that we hit them with the good news before we hit them with the bad news. Meaning, before you go and tell everybody they're going to hell because they're having sex outside of marriage, you know, it's a mortal sin. Before you, you go. You did that this morning. I know, but I'm not doing I'm talking about them, not me. Okay. Anyway, so, but what you need to do, unless you're a preacher, when I got to get people, that on one on one, you tell them the good news first, which means before God set the people from Israel, before he gave them the commandments, the Ten Commandments, he first set them free from their slavery. We love to give commandments to people before we set them free. So you notice I first talked about the love of God and how God loves you and how you're beloved to him before I kicked you in the pants first. But it has to be that order that we set them free before we give them commandments. So you pray for them, you love them, and then you witness to them. Most of the people in your life have their basic needs met. You don't have to feed them. You don't have to give them something to drink. You don't have to give them shelter and clothes. But you know what I noticed? Are you the most appealing person in their lives? In other words, whether it's your wife, somebody you know, a cousin, obnoxious Uncle Fred, you ever sit and just talk to them? You ever notice that? When you first meet somebody and you walk away immediately liking them, and you're thinking, what? Boy, that guy, I like that guy. Why? Because he asked all about you. He listened, he wanted to talk about you. He asked you about your kids, he asked you about your job. You walked away, you didn't even know his name. I think we gotta do more of that because that's the kind of way you show them you're different. You're the one person in their lives that truly takes an interest in them. I ask Father Larry about all kinds of stuff, but I have to put it very simple Never questions once. because Never he, Never. you start getting into complex Never. questions, you know, he, he wanted this to be true false. Never. He didn't, yeah, you don't exactly. like these short, you don't like these short answer essays. Short answer essays. Yeah, know? but I'm still quick. I'm still quick. I still got the For punch. 90, sure. You're in that quick, real quick. Hey, Brothers. you want to know, we had, we had a birthday for Father Larry. There was 58 candles on the cake, and that was a piece I had. Uh, <laughs> wisdom. You notice the difference in gray. Just notice. Go ahead. What is uh, the best way to have a consistent prayer life, to form the habit of prayer? I already said something about it. Why don't you start? Go go. Okay. Again, the biggest way is being a man of discipline. The Word of God says my people die for lack of discipline. The earliest and the best way to do it, gentlemen, is to do it in the morning. And so, again, I have my first Mass at 7 a.m. No Bible, no breakfast, no, no Bible, Bible, no, no bed. bed. Yes, but, my, but even before, even that, that, you know, why do you wake up in the morning, gentlemen? Do you wake up to make money? Do you wake up to work out? I love these guys that love to wake up early to work out. Well, that's great. 
you're still going to die and you're going to be worm meat one day. <laughs> but do you sit there and do you wake up for Jesus Christ? So I love to ask these guys, that, you know, I have ripples in my stomach. Whoa, I have a six-pack, Father. Shut up. I got a case. I could care. I mean, no. You got a case. You got, a, you got ripples in your head, too. But, but anyway, so I say, how much time do you work out in your body every day? And they go, about an hour. I say, how much time do you work out in your soul every day? Two minutes. Oh, oh, isn't that nice? You better be darn well working out on your soul as much as you're working out on your body, gentlemen. Yeah, and before you wait, about ninety percent of these dudes don't work out in their body. Well, a couple you know of them, a couple, the young ones do. Okay. But the biggest one is you, you got to learn to wake up early for God. That's when you're going to get your time in. If I didn't do my holy hour in the morning, it's very hard. But there are days I don't. But the best way then, if you can't do it, then you got to do this. Like I told you in the beginning, you must commit yourself to beginning at five minutes a day. Say, God, on my soul, I promise you for the rest of my life, I'll give you five minutes a day. And you put a thing, something on your pillow, it says pray, and don't you ever go to bed without giving God five minutes. Don't ever do it. You discipline yourself, and you'll be able to do it. Sprinkle it, too. Sprinkle a lot of it. times we think, you know, you got to have these periods. Sprinkle it throughout all day. Hi, Lord. It's a beautiful day. Thank you for it. Hey, Lord, have mercy on me. Give me, give me some strength in this one here. It's going to be tough. i got to be with Father Larry today. Give me yeah. patience. <laughs> You know, I was praying, man, you were an occasion of prayer for me all uh, morning. I bet you you were I was, yeah. But, but again, when you're doing that, the problem is you got to make sure you're listening to God. Remember, the prophets came before God and said, speak, Lord, I'm listening. Not shut up, God, I'm talking. And most men never shut up. They'll say their rosary, they'll say prayers. And God says, you know, like I have a book coming out called Just Live It, Living the, uh, the Ten Principles of the World's Most Famous Prayer, which is the Lord's Prayer. And part of that is, is like when you say your will be done to God, he says, okay, shut up. I want to tell you what my will is today. Well, I am not interested. Well, God. so that's easy for me to pray five minutes because I don't have to say nothing. Well, if you, sit even, there. even if you did that, that'd be a great thing if you sat there and listened to God actively, of course. I would agree. Right. But most people can't do that. But listening is the most important part of prayer. That's why when I told you about Mark 111, you listen to God tell you every day, you are my beloved son. When you start your day with the Bible and you end your day with the Bible, you start your day by listening to God and you end your day by listening to God. That way you're going to do God's will in you your know, life. You can tell you ain't married. I know. Because well, I'm used to listening. I'm married to I'm the whole church. I'm used to listening. Oh, okay. No, you're not. Do what the I, women tell you, nobody gets hey, hurt. everybody knows his wife is back there. I want you to go and, first of all, give her comfort and tell her, I'm so sorry you married him. And then I want you to ask her the questions that he's saying. Okay, oh first, my of God, all, yeah, yeah, yeah. first of all, first of all, I haven't first. said this. I'm not a whiner. Yeah, but yeah, two yeah. weeks ago, two weeks ago, all of her credit cards were stolen. Uh huh. And I didn't report it because the thieves spend less than she does. Uh. <laughs> You see what I got to put up with. Anyway. Next question, gentlemen. That was good. <laughs> this is uh, from a gentleman named Matt. I have problems with anxiety. I sometimes have trouble offering up my sufferings. Can you give me advice on how to remind myself to offer up my sufferings to help my family? How do we offer up sufferings? I'll give you advice on how to conquer the anxiety. Anxiety is the number one clinical symptom. Most people are afraid of anxiety. That sounds funny, doesn't it? Because they have a panic attack or some type of generalized anxiety, and they think, I'm losing my mind. I'm having a heart attack. I better get to the emergency room. I can't go in that situation. That situation is too distressful. Simple catchphrase. Distress is not danger. When people are having an anxiety reaction, they think they're in danger. Their body is having the same reaction as if somebody took out a gun and pointed it at their head. But there is no danger. So the first thing I would suggest to him is he's got to understand the nature of what's going on in his body. It's not a threat. There's the problem. Now, Father, you help him out with the Shit. offering it up. There you go. The, the, the two things I'd encourage you is first, is you write... So anxiety is a free-floating fear, right? 
And so you got to get it out of yourself. So often I'll tell people if they're struggling with anxiety or depression or other things, and my degree is in counseling, I don't have a doctorate like His Holiness here. But the reality <laughs> is, what I do, he makes me do it all that time. He, you know, he usually has a ring and he puts it in his pocket and say, kiss my ring. But anyway, so we got to sit there. I don't and, say kiss my ring. Yeah, anyway, we got to sit there. <laughs> Father, you're supposed to control this. Yeah, anyway, so. It's spinning out of control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the first thing you got to do is write all the things that are causing you anxiety or causing you fear. And I'm sure it's not, I'm telling you it's not going to fill a piece of paper. But then on another sheet of paper, I want you to start writing down all the things that you're blessed with. You can walk, you can talk, you can hear, you can see. Jesus died on the cross for you. You can receive his body and blood. You have people that love you. You can eat every day. You'll always have more to praise God for than you will to be anxious over. And when you're getting anxious, start praising God. Lord, I thank you that I can see. Lord, I thank you that I can hear. Lord, I thank you that I can walk. And you will be lifted up. And that's the first thing. The second thing is just to say, Lord, I offer up this struggle with you now for the poor souls or for my family. It's just an act of the will. But then say, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. I am a big one. I hate to fly. And I fly constantly. And it'd be better if I was flying the plane, you know, but they don't let me do that. But the reality is when I have to go and put my... Uh, whole being under someone else's who could be drunk or anything else, it drives me nuts. So when I sit getting anxious, Jesus, I trust in you. And then I'll say Psalm 91. You know, and so great things can happen. The Word of God has the power to change and calm your heart. So if you immerse yourself in there, or you find places that cause you anxiety, and you go and say, nothing will be able to harm me. That's the Word of God. The Word of God is anointed. And it has the power to calm you, I promise you. So, a couple things. Yeah, well, you could tell. It's a good thing you didn't get married. Because I know. Because if you don't want to put yourself under somebody else's power 24-7, you better you got stay that single. Right. I know. That's why I only fly when I have to. Anyway, go ahead. Many large companies these days push that homosexuality is a human rights issue. How do we share God's truth at work despite public opposition? Again, for me, I think we preach the good news first. And it is, uh, everybody has a right to, you know, equal rights. But we got to, remember one of the biggest adages is you love the sinner and hate the sin. And sometimes we say that, but we hate both. And that's the problem. Once I sat there and I was in college chaplain, I was also a college chaplain, and we had this trigon, which is a big gay and lesbian group. And I was in there hearing confessions because I had mass at 8 o'clock on Sunday nights and then afterwards I hear confessions. And this group had a video camera and they're talking to all my kids. And they're saying, do you believe homosexual? And they were getting crucified. And they said, Father, we're getting killed out there. I said, just wait till I come out. Okay, so I went and the guy's waiting for me. So he's going, okay, Father. He said, can I ask you some questions? I go, absolutely. He says, do you think that uh, homosexual can go to heaven? Well, sure. What? Do you believe it's a sin? Oh, sure. And he goes, and then we go back and forth. And I said, yes, but some is sex before marriage. A sin, you know, once I had one of my kids, were gonna, he was in the Air Force for 10 years, and he was going to leave. And I said, why are you leaving the Air Force? He said, I'm leaving, Father. He says, because they let gay people in here. I said, son, they've let gay people in the Air Force a lot longer than this. But I said, that's okay, get it. But are, is, there, is there Catholic men and women in the Air Force that are having sex outside of marriage? Well, yeah. Well, why aren't you leaving for that one? Are, are there guys in, in the Air Force that are not going to Mass on Sunday? Well, yeah. Well, why aren't you leaving the Air Force for that? That's all mortal sin, right? And so this guy came, and so I sat there, and I said, sin is sin. I can't tell you it's not sin. But you know what? And it's to this day, I've had four friends that die of AIDS, every one because of homosexuality. And what they were all looking for was love. And so what I said to this man, I said, what you're looking for, sir, is to be loved. And no one will ever love you the way Jesus Christ will love you. And this man sat there and he says to the person, because we were on camera, he says, please turn off the camera. So he turned off the camera. Then he started crying and he says, Father, can you help me? Of course I can help you. I could have fought with him for an hour. I'm pretty good at it. About why homosexuality is wrong. But I would not have brought him home to Christ. I brought him home to Christ by telling him he was still loved, but saying sin is sin, and that we go beyond that. 
So that's what I do. You have to sit there and you got to make a, you got to stand up, but you got to be consistent what you're standing for. If you're going to go against homosexuality, it's all. So is everyone who's married outside the church. So is everyone who's married, who's a kid that has sex outside of marriage. So is missing mass on Sunday. It's all morally sinful. They all go to hell the same way. You better stand up consistently. And if you wouldn't want someone, because some of you are in bad marriages, meaning you're no different. You're mad marriage. If you drop dead, you go to hell. That's the way it is. So if you don't want us to come up and constantly tell you, you know, you're going to hell if you don't get out of that bad marriage, then you better watch how you deal with other people who don't have the same issues as you do. My son was just made a sergeant. He's 25. I have a daughter who is a captain. She's a JAG lawyer. And then I got another son who works for the Department of Defense texted my son this morning, the 25-year-old, because he's same-sex attraction. He knows how much his mother and I love him. We have to love him. We got no choice. He also knows very clearly where we are with this. He doesn't agree with it at all. He doesn't understand it. But he's got one foot in that world and one foot in the Catholic Church. He doesn't want to leave the Catholic Church. So we're hoping and praying at some point he learns to live chaste. We think he has so far in a lot of respects. But we got to love that boy, and we got to tell him how much we love him all the time because without that, we got no chance. He'd be gone. He'd be alienated. He'd head into the world where he finds acceptance, and he's got to know his mother and father. And the church. Him. Yeah. Thank you. What are ways and arguments for us to speak about the importance of a child being raised with both a mother and a father? You can cite the data. The data is overwhelming. There is no study in all of psychology that has more support than divorce is bad for children. No study. Now, obviously, some people are victims. Their spouses leave them. But I'll tell you from a shrink's perspective, 80% of the people who leave those marriages is because I don't like you anymore. I'm not happy with you anymore. I found somebody I think I'll like better. That's 80% of it, okay? So as a result, I always tell my clients, whether they're, whether they're religious people or whether they're not, I say, are you, uh, you ready for your 14-year-old son to probably not want to see you anymore because he thinks you tore the family apart? Are you ready for that five-year-old boy of yours, if your wife remarries, to have a stepdad that your five-year-old son is with 85% of the week and is his new daddy. You ready for that? Because they don't even think this. So flat out, the research is overwhelming on the fact that two parents is the best way. I just saw a study the other day, and I've said this over and over, and it's good to see studies about it. Well, we'll just wait until the kids are grown up. Then we'll split. Really? Now, the study says what you would think. Adult kids don't do well with this either. It tears them up too. Again, the best thing we have always we teach is that the best thing a man can do is love his wife. That's the best thing he can do for his children. And again, I think it comes down to this crisis of masculinity that we, we're not going to change society, gentlemen, until we change us. Until we start saying, okay, we, again, that's why society doesn't teach people how to be men. So we got to do that again. And again, one of the best things is that, like, my busiest day of the year is Father's Day. Because so many kids have said, Father, you're my dad. Because I was strong with them, I loved them, I brought them to Jesus. And so we have to also, in a society where there's a lot of people that are running with just no fathers in there, we got to be the men that stand up. You know, priests now, again, priests have been afraid to be with kids because of all the scandal. And that's from the devil himself. We need to truly be mentor, especially to boys, to teach them what it is to be men. And so, and again, if you have your own kids, be mentors to them, but bring other ones who do not have mother, I mean, who don't have fathers in their lives. You've got to take these boys under your wing so you can love them and teach them what it is to be a man. Because we're going to have to start with ourselves, because we can quote everything, but their society is a mess. And we got to be bringing this light instead of cursing the darkness. we got to bring the light of Christ to the midst of it. A couple of things, man. They did a survey on kids who grew up without fathers and turned out okay. 
And a high percentage of those kids said, uh, yeah, I had an uncle. I had an uncle that kind of took me under his wing. I had a coach. I had a coach that uh, kind of, a neighbor guy, neighbor guy kind of included me in stuff that he did. There was one solid guy in their lives. I used to do a Bible study in the prison, and those guys basically would say things like, yeah, my uncle took me to church once, and that's why I'm at this Bible study, because I remember he was the only one that ever took me to church. So that's a huge factor. Let me share with you something else, an interesting stat. I saw a survey that said, if mom and dad take the kids to church, you got an 80% chance of the kids going to church when they're older. If nobody takes the kids to church, you got about a 20% chance. Now, I think these stats have dropped since that study. Okay, that study was 15 years ago. If mom alone takes the kid to church, it's 50%. If dad alone takes the kids to church, it's 80%. It's the same rate as if mom and dad. Would you explain why going to confession for the forgiveness of your sins is best? <laughs> because, well, it's very simple. It's because God gave the power in uh, John's gospel right after the uh, uh, resurrection. Jesus breathed on them. Shh. And he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Those whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Those whose sins you hold bound are held bound. And then two, he says, and James, is there any, uh, uh, confess your sins one to another that you may find healing. But the biggest thing, too, is that every sin is not just between you and Jesus. Every sin is between you and the whole body of Christ. So when you sin... And you sit there. Let's say you steal. Like I beat the hell out of Dr. Ray. Wouldn't take much. Yeah, let's you're fantasizing. Let's say I beat boy. the hell out of Dr. Ray. And then I don't talk to Dr. Ray. And I go to Jesus. And I say, Jesus, I am so sorry that I beat the hell out of Dr. Ray. But you know, he had too much hell in him. I had to get it out. You know, and so. And then what's God, Jesus going to say to me? Well, that's nice, Larry. Of course. But what are you going to have to do to be forgiven? I'm going to have to go to You're Dr. Ray. You're going to pay Ray. my attorney fees. Yeah, I'm going to have to go to Dr. Ray and tell Ray I'm sorry. Because every sin, even if you're alone in that sin, you know what I mean. You hurt everybody in the body of Christ. And so you can go to the head, but Jesus says you got to go and ask for everybody else's forgiveness. You hurt them all. So he gave a priest to represent both him and the whole body to bring you back into the body. And then the second part of that is people that don't want to go to confession, they'll spend a hundred or what's he charged, like $400 an hour to see a shrink. And the only thing you do when you see a shrink is go to confession. I'm sorry. And he goes, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, uh -huh. tell me more. $400 That'll more. Yes, please now. You. And you go back. You go to that and do the priest, you're going to you're confession. You're not trained to nod, right? I yeah, can yeah. nod. You nod. Okay, so... But after that, go he just that. has to do this. After I hear that, I go, now I absolve you of all your sins. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. So it's just a need. Confession is a need, whether you believe it or not. Protestants, I once did a, a, a Protestant, a Baptist Protestant minister's youth group. And I said, I said, what do you want me to talk about? He said, I want you to talk about confession. What? <laughs> he says, I want you to talk about the, the, everybody. There was like 500 kids there about confession. Okay. So I did. And I said, the ministers want to be there. Of course, we don't believe they have the power to forgive, but that's all beside the thing. They'll be there if you want to go and talk to them about any of this stuff, and they'll pray God's mercy over you. Every single Baptist kid went to confession to one of the ministers. It's a need in us. That's all. One of the problems as a psychologist is that people are not very insightful. They really don't know much about themselves. They don't scour themselves. They don't look at themselves. They think they're a lot nicer and sweeter people than they really are. Not me. <laughs> I know I'm a miserable son of a son. So yeah. I know. You don't have to tell me. I've been carrying your dead backside for years. I know. It's terrible. Anyway. Confession makes you look at yourself. Mm -hmm. It's the one thing in your life that makes you look at yourself. You have to be honest with who you are. I'll tell you guys, in marriages all the time, they come into my office, they're clueless about how they come across, about what they do to their spouses, or what they do to other people. If you don't go to confession, you'll never look at yourself.
unless you pay me $400 an hour. Speaking of confession, the line is absolutely empty. It's and empty. There's a lot of you that are sinners. So hey, you only give an Our Father. I know. Man, that's really good. I know. But, yeah, you know, our what, some people give a rosary, and that's okay. Whatever they want. What's next? When I was a kid, eating meat on Friday was a mortal sin, and all year, and, eat, and uh, eating after midnight and going to communion was also a sin. Why not now? Those are big small T's. You know, small T's is the main reason. Like, for uh, you can do the same thing about your diocese might have a holy day on a Thursday, like Holy Thursday, like most places have it during Thursdays of Lent. Like the real Catholics. Like the real Catholics. And then you go to other dioceses that don't do Holy Thursday, they put it on to Sunday. How you do that, I don't know, but there's a lot of dioceses. I don't know what your diocese is. Wait, wait, real quick, not Holy Thursday, Corpus Christi. No, no, or Ascension, 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 Ascension Thursday. Okay, okay. Yeah, 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 Ascension Thursday. So Ascension Thursday, do you do it on Sunday or you do it on? We're wimps. It's you Sunday do, here. Oh, okay. So you do Ascension Thursday on Sunday. But anyway, but my diocese and a lot of dioceses is not. So if you're in my diocese and you miss Mass on Holy Thursday, what is that? Mortal sin. If you're in this diocese and you don't go that Thursday, you go that Sunday because they transferred it. Is it a mortal sin? No. Why? It's an obedience issue. So the way we have done these things throughout the years is obedience things. You know, so it used to be, okay, from midnight the night before you go to communion. You couldn't, you couldn't go. And then they said, no, it's too hard for people. People are passing out, throwing up different things. So let's put it to an hour. They do that. They could do that because it's a small T, you know. And they can do, like on Sunday, uh, Fridays, it's still the teaching of the church, no meat on Lent. I'm mean, not only Lent, but every Friday. But the American bishops and other bishops throughout the, United, uh, throughout the world says, no, because you do realize some people love fish. I do not. I believe that those people who love fish should be made to eat meat on Fridays during Lent. <laughs> I'm just saying. Because these people, oh, I get to eat fresh English. This is Shut why up. you never got to be bishop. I know, exactly, and never will be. But the reality is that it was a way we all showed our penance together. But the American bishops and other ones says, listen, some people like fish too much, so we're not going to make fish the thing during the rest of the year. you got to decide what penance you want to do. But every Friday you're called to do a penance. You know, but it's changed. But if your out. teenage son comes to you and says, hey, Pop, I want Pop. you to know I agree with you 90% of the time. And when I agree with you, I'll obey you. 10% of the time, I don't agree with you. So I reserve the right to myself to disobey. But you should be pretty happy because I'm with you 90% of the time. That makes me a pretty good kid. Would you say that's an obedient kid? Of course not, because he arrogates to himself the decision on what to obey and what not to obey. That happens in our Catholic faith. I obey the church most of the time, but you know, that part about the contraception, I don't buy that. And that uh, eating meat there thing on uh, Lent, you know, ah, come on. All right, so, but, but I'm pretty good the other 90%. That's not the way it goes. But I, I agree with Father 100%. It's a matter of discipline. If the church says, under the authority of Christ, to be a Catholic, we would like the obligation of no meat on Friday. And if you say, eh, okay, yeah, well, I don't buy it. I'm not doing it. You've just basically told the church, I'm above you. Okay, I can pick and choose. Now, if the church then says, well, that particular piece of discipline really no longer applies. You can go to Red Lobster. You can go to a fish buffet. You know, this is not the days when this was a real sacrifice 500 years ago. All right, so we can change that. But that's the church's authority, not ours, not mine. That's the difference. That was very good, Doctor. Thank you. Yeah. There's you been a question just asking for... You should for... come to more of my sessions. I will. Why contraception is considered to be morally a mortal sin. Yes. Well, you already talked with it. I didn't deal with it at all. But the reality is that, like, especially, I love, the, I love to pick on guys here when they got, you know, you got snipped. First of all, to ever let a, somebody down there with a pair of scissors, I have no idea. But, yeah. And then, you know, and then those of you, guys that come to confession and say, do you use artificial birth control? They go, no, I don't, but my wife does. Do you have sex with your wife, sir? Well, yeah. Well, you do, too. 
Oh, I never thought of it that way. Oh, what a pagan. Anyway, <laughs> what you're doing is Christ got to be in charge. He has to be Lord of every part of your life, or he's Lord of no part of your life. It takes one thin uh, thread to keep a bird from flying. So if you say, Jesus, you're Lord of all my life, I want you to be Lord of everything, except my sexual life. I'm the teenager. You stay out of my bed. You stay out of here. Now, God says that every act of life must be like him. Every act of sex. The first commandment ever out of God's mouth was what? Be Increase fruitful. and multiply. He taught us at the very beginning when it was created, when he first commandment was to have sex. And then he tells us why to have sex. You have sex to multiply. So the purpose of sex, so every act of sex must have be open to love and be open to life. If it's not open to life, then it's no different. If you're having sex with your wife, oral sex, and it ends in itself, it's no different than you having sex with another man, is it? What's, what's different? It's Can sterile. life come out of it? Sterile. It's a sterile thing. So again, so you can't sit there and say, well, ah, uh -uh, I decide. No, you don't decide. Every, you are a co-creator with God. Now, you can work with God, and so that means if you do natural family planning that you have to have about five or six days or seven at the most where you can't have sex with your wife if you're no one, because you're, you're allowed to go naturally with your body and her body and then co-create with God that way. And then people say, you mean I can't have sex six days out of a month? I haven't had sex in 58 years, gentlemen. <laughs> when you go as long as me, I will feel sad for you. But I don't feel sad for any of you. Doctor? My 10 kids are adopted. Adopted. My wife said when we first got married, well, if that's what we have to do to have kids, we're going to adopt. Yeah. Didn't want to have sex with him. You got it? Yeah. Hey, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you, it's bad. This is bad. They were like, whoo, oh right over God. there. <laughs> Would they sit you guys according to IQ or what? <laughs> you know something that helped me a lot, Father? No, 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 no. When I, if I contracept, I'm basically saying to God, I'm smarter than you. <laughs> if you want to give me a life, I overrule you. I've decided you don't know what you're doing. That, for me, helps a lot. It know? helps a lot. My wife and I, by the way, when we adopted, yeah. our ninth child was an unplanned adoption. You know, we uh -huh. were practicing safe phone. <laughs> <laughs> next, next question. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> the two of you have mentioned fasting. What would you both recommend as regarding strategies for fasting? I have learned to fast a lot in, uh, in the last year. And it was just, it was both, a, I'm, a, I'm a diabetic and a, another thing uh, for my spiritual. So what I do is I fast every day. I just eat one meal a day. And it's been the greatest thing I've ever done. Spiritually, it's been. Must be one heck of a meal. I know. <laughs> I, I, I am 180 now. I used to be 235. But anyway, so, and he always picked on me. You know, because he's so miserably skinny, there's nothing to times a balloon go Anyway, up. but fasting is part of, they've done all these studies on the importance of fasting, just science. But when it comes to spiritual fasting, Jesus Christ fasted, did he not? So did all the other apostles. And so the best way to do is you can do a fast on, you have to do it, the only time you must do it in a year is when? Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. And really, neither of those are really big fasts. One big meal and two small meals that don't equal the big one. But you can do it every Friday since you have to do a thing. You, can uh, you have to do some kind of penance. You can just start off with just no in-between meals on Fridays. Is that a fast? Yes. You can do, the, okay, I'll just eat one meal that day, or I'll just eat two meals that day. But fasting isn't only uh, from the physical stuff. Like I talk to people, you know, start fasting from that stuff which causes you sin. So if you have an addiction to pornography, if you have an addiction to looking at your phone or different things, so for Lent and that, you fast from the computer. You fast from those things that cause you sin. So, but physical fasting, I encourage as people start easy, you know, just, you know, no between meals on a Friday or whatever, and then you can build up to wherever the Lord's calling you to. But it's also healthy to fast. All this stuff where they tell you, oh, no, I can't tell you. I'm off all my diabetes stuff because of fasting. 
and I was on it for a long time. So all the studies are showing more and more that fasting is not only good for your soul, but it's good for your body. If we have to fast from things that cause sin, that, you one, talk at that all. one Lent, I didn't <laughs> let any of the children in the house. Go ahead. My kids are gone now, and uh, my wife and I have gotten into a parent protection program where they're going to alter our identities, relocate us in Montana. Next question. You're all business, aren't you? I am. All business. What advice? There's a lot of questions that these guys are asking. What advice do you have for a young man looking to, uh, to join a new parish? Are all parishes the same, or are there, are there certain things we should look for? Oh, dear. <laughs> I'm a big one at staying at your parish because, you know, like, your diocese is different. My diocese, I've been the pastor 17 years in my parish, and I'll be there, God willing, till I retire at 75. And it's something about being in relationship with uh, your pastor. And again, if your pastor doesn't know God, then you gotta find someone who does, I'm just sorry, because, and again, there are priests that don't know God. There just is, I don't care what anybody says. There are. And so then you have to find a place where they do. And the best way for me is to find out is always watch the pastor and to see how he says mass. And if he, when he's saying mass, if you know that he knows that he's holding the body, blood, soul, and divinity, God of the universe in his hand, that's a good place to go because your pastor can discern. If your pastor cannot discern the very basic stuff that I'm holding God in my hands at Mass, then that's the hard thing. But I'm very much, you know, pastors come and go. So you should still, up to me, uh, uh, you should stay focused on your parish and stay there and then keep praying that God will bring your pastor to a deeper conversion. But I would stay in your parish before I'd go looking somewhere else myself. Can you please discuss the difference between mortal sin and venial sin, and do both need to be confessed, or oh, just that's one? the lady that approached. She approached me, and she oh, said really? that was confusing, and she wanted you to straighten it out. Very, okay. All sin needs to be confessed, of course. So you should, and, my, and again, different priests will give different things. A mortal sin kills your soul before God. A venial sin wounds it. The way I was taught when I was a child, the sisters taught us that when you go, when you are baptized, you have your sanctifying grace and you have a white soul. And then when you get, if you commit a venial sin, you put a little black dot on that soul. So if you have a lot of venial sins, you have a lot of black dots. If you commit a mortal sin, it all becomes black. I remember when I was a kid going to confession once, and I came home, and I go, oh, okay, my soul's all white, it's all white, it's all white. And then my sister said something, I yelled at her, and I said, ah, and you just put a black mark on my soul. It's terrible. Look at that. Ah, 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 ah. Venial sins, though, look it up. I don't make these things up. Venial sins are taken care of beginning a mass. That doesn't mean you don't confess venial sins, but I'm saying, like, if we're doing something like this, and we have 1,200 men and 11 priests, we can't get everybody to go. So I always say, if you just go to venial sins, okay, your mass will cover that. If you're in mortal sin, and the difference is, if you die in venial sin, where are you going? Purgatory. If you die in mortal sin, where are you going? To hell. Period. So mortal sins must be confessed according to teaching a church. And to confess a mortal sin, you need, I mean, it has to be, for something to be serious, it needs serious matter, full knowledge, full consent of the will. It's wrong, you know it's wrong, and you decide to do it anyway. Mortal sins always have to be taught about how many you do. Now, you have to sit there and say, for instance, like, have you missed one mass or have you missed a hundred masses, huh? Like, even with my questions, I'll go back on how many when it comes to mortal sins. Is it something, you know, but don't go wacko. Like, you know, people say, I told a dirty joke 302 times, I think. Oh, shut up. Really, now you brought lying into it, but... All sin needs to be confessed, but, and it comes from John's letter, all sins are, all sins are wrong, but not all sins are deadly. That's where we get it from the Word of God. There's a lot of questions just on the whole issue of morality in the realm of uh, sexual addiction in all aspects. What are ways to fight against these, yeah, these realities in the life of many, many people in our world? You can start psych. Okay. Gentlemen, you don't want to know the stats on pornography. Mm. Let me share with you something. <laughs> you don't want to know. Let me share with you yeah. something. <laughs> <laughs> it was a rhetorical device. Oh, okay, okay, okay. 
If you took philosophy, you'd know that. I, yeah, I got a degree in it. Thank you very much. Anyway. One survey indicated between the ages of 11 and 19, mm -hmm. what percentage of men, boys, do you think have come across pornography accidentally or on purpose? It is 90%. That is right. It is 90%. Homosexual pornography is 75%. Mm -hmm. Wonder why we got so many confused kids out there. I would say this, and I get this from a lot of parents. They discover that their trustworthy Catholic kid has been on the internet. I said, would you, you have any screening? Well, no, we just, we knew, we trusted him. Yeah, right. Nonsense. You better have total screening. Now, once it's happened, what you have to do is work a little bit on the perspective of, after you take care of all the holy things that Father's going to tell you, you got to make it less likely to get there. Wives will come into my office, and they're devastated because they just found out their husband's been on pornography for three and a half years. They feel like, no wonder he doesn't want to touch me. I'm, I'm, I'm not photoshopped, okay? So as a result, I tell the guy, well, then you, you really can't have your smartphone. You can't have that computer. They look at me like I'm nuts. It's right there. You can't. You've got to start eliminating this. That's one factor. Addiction is a word that's thrown around a lot. Addiction used to be a rather narrow thing, physiologically speaking. Well, now we're, we're drifting into anything that seems to be a habitual thing. We call it an addiction. Although one could make the case that there are certain physiological brain changes that occur under the visions of pornography, all right? There's, there's evidence for that. Um, it's a, it, it is, Father, I, I got to believe it is probably the most common serious sin that priests hear in the confessional, and these are guys who still go to confession, okay? Yeah. And, and again, the two sins that most men deal with are anger and lust. They are the sins of men, and they are the things that you hear most in confession. Lust has really exploded, huh? And because society is so lust-filled, and a couple things is what I tell people and what I have had to do in my life, because I struggle with, you know, people sitting there. Every day, I have sexual temptation. It didn't automatically go away when I got to be a priest. You know, I got mad when I was in seminary with Sister Faustina because I read her book, uh, Divine Mercy in My Soul. I really got mad at Jesus, not Faustina, because Fa Jesus came to her one day and took a golden sash of purity and put it around her and says, Faustina, you will never be tempted again sexually the rest of your life. And I said, excuse me, she was a nun in a convent. Give me the, that thing, I want that. He they didn't don't give make it to them me. that big. I know, oh, shut up, anyway. I want it. And so what I have done and what I encourage other people to do is first you got to get the source of temptation out of your life as uh, Dr. Ray already talked about. But then you got to ask the Holy Spirit. I'm very big on having devotion to the Holy Spirit. And remember what St. Paul says. He would hold all thoughts captive to the Holy Spirit. The second part with the spiritual thing is to go to St. Joseph because St. Joseph you know, we know the Blessed Mother had no sin, correct? Did St. Joseph have sin? Yes. He was a man. He knows what it was to have the most beautiful woman that ever existed on the earth, and he never touched her. So I've always went to Joseph to be my mentor in heaven, to be the one who prays for me, to be the one that sits there to do that. So you need someone in heaven that does that, and Joseph is a great one. He will help you, I promise you. But the second thing is you need a brother. You need a brother that's going to challenge you, you know, and it's going to help you. It's going to say, so are you been looking at porn that's going to, that you're going to tell him, you know, so that brother that's going to help you, not make fun of you. Men need men. And if you, if you can't trust a brother, then you really need a priest. And not a priest that's going to kick you and tell you you're no good. But it's going to help you and encourage you to get up and keep getting better. Because gentlemen, all these addictions, Jesus can set you free from. It's a lie from the devil for him to tell you that he has you. He doesn't have you. That's a fantasy. Jesus Christ can set you free from all the things you're addicted to. 
if you let him, okay? I've been shrinking for 40 years. Phew. I used to be like 6'9". Yeah. <laughs> and it occurred to me in my career that nothing seems to change someone more powerfully than a conversion. All the counseling in the world, all the therapy in the world goes by fits and starts, even with the most motivated person. But the truly 180 degree turned around lives have only, I've been seen, by conversion to Christ. Now, just as an aside, Father, I want to, you fine. haven't brought out some of the differences between men and women. For example. For example. Now, what I did to you, like here. Yeah. If I would ever just look at a woman, a woman and go, man, you get a little yeah, hippie there, yeah, right? Yeah. It's dead. You're shot in the head with a bazooka. It's not going to happen. Guys, you can do this. Hey, bulking up, aren't you? Yeah, I'm going to hit for power next year. Yeah, I'm going to yeah, hit yeah. the long ball. You know, we, we guys do this. You know, I noticed that. You know another di difference between guys and women? I've noticed this. What's that? Men, you can be a PhD nuclear physicist. They love the Three Stooges. Yeah, they, Women true. go, oh, that's just ridiculous. Yeah, that's not that's even true. funny. I can't believe that. And the guys are going, oh, hey, you put. Anyway, Father wants to give us another question. All right, he's, he's getting impatient. <laughs> this uh, question may lead someone back to the confessional. I'm afraid to go to confession. I've been sterilized. But I know that I will not be able to give up sex for the rest of my entire life. No, that's not the teaching of the church. But anyway, go ahead. Thus, I can't make a good confession. Again, sterilization, as I already talked about that very briefly, it's uh, a lot of men here have been sterilized, right? <laughs> you're, you're a eunuch. Anyway, but the reality is you have become, you have been made one. Now, I once, I've asked so many bishops and cardinals about this because some priests have actually told people you got to go and you got to get it reversed. You know, because and every, every priest and every moral theologian I've asked, I, I've, I've heard, no, you don't have to get it reversed. Now, again, there might be priests here that disagree with me, but I'm just telling you that I deal with men more than most other priests everywhere, and I've asked specifically, I've studied it, but, but you need to confess it, and then they tell people, then you need to live as a person who is living uh, a way that natu no, natural family planning, so like six days a, a month you abstain as a penance for that kind of stuff. You know, so again, you can go to confession. Go to confession. Come to confession. I've heard this oh, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of times, literally. But again, we don't want to keep you in sin. We want to set you free. There's a lot of you did stuff when you were young, but then you came to your conversion. So you can't go back. But we can sit there and we can do a lot about your future. You know, we can't, and we can do a lot about your past. Jesus can. He'll pay the price for it. Okay? Unless, Father, do you have anything else to say with that? Okay. Is it anti-Catholic to not embrace or like the Pope? Oh, you asked the wrong person. <laughs> the Pope is who Jesus Christ put on this earth. You don't have to like him, but you must obey him. You're forbidden to talk about him. You're forbidden to put him down. You're forbidden to judge him. If you ever do, you make yourself better than God himself. You judge Christ himself, and you say what Christ has done is wrong. You don't you ever talk about our Holy Father. He's the one who put, it was put in there by God himself. And to go against the Holy Father is to go against God. Now, there are people, even on EWTN, Raymond Aurora, who's on my thing, I'm embarrassed as hell to be on the same EWTN network with him, who with him and his papal posse go against the Holy Father every time he opens his mouth, that these are people who do not have humility and who do nothing for the building up of the kingdom of God. They tear it apart. So if you don't like the Holy Father, great. Keep your mouth shut. You're forbidden to talk against the Holy Father. And if you want to, I'll let you do it this way. You fast for him on bread and water alone every Friday for six months, and then you're allowed to say one negative thing about him. You got it? But don't you ever sit there and say you're a Catholic if you don't like the Holy Father. What you are is you are a protestant who just happens to be an ultra-conservative. Because I can't take people who think, I've never thought I'd see a time in the church where there are people in the church that are more Catholic than the Pope. 
We have come to that time. And so if you are more Catholic than the Pope, you're not Catholic. You're a Protestant who goes to church. Now, I'm very clear about that. And if you don't like that, that's kind of tough. You better learn to submit yourself to the authority, whether you agree with the authority or whether you don't. That's what I believe. I'm sorry that I got so heated. Father, I think, I, please, don't sugarcoat it. Yeah, Just come yeah, right yeah, out yeah, and tell yeah, us, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay? I think you need yeah, yeah. to be more forthright. I am, I don't care. Yeah, I'm miserable. How do I respond to, and I hear this often, so this, how do I respond to priests in the confessional who tell me that my sins don't matter? Oh. Or I don't need to really be there? They offer no solution, no advice. Hmm. Well, what you, you want me to do it? Yeah, I'll you do it. Do it. Go there. for it. My grandma came from Italy when she was eight. She couldn't read. If the priest said it, that's the way it was. You didn't need an argument. You didn't need a debate. She really didn't know the catechism or anything like that. So she was kind of bound with whatever priest she happened to be talking to. You don't have that anymore. If a priest tells you something like that, you have all kinds of means to check out how the church has taught. You got catechism, you got the internet, you can easily contact another priest. So you have no excuse when something is told to you that sounds funny not to check it out. And again, sometimes a priest is helping someone who's scrupulous. You know, like if you're coming in every three days, or like the other day, someone that was, how long since your last confession? One hour, Father, but I didn't like what the other priest said. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So it, you can be focused on self, but if you're sinning and you're looking for help, the problem is that, and I've been doing, hearing confessions for 28 years, that uh, first of all, a lot of people don't really know their real sins. They're only focusing on, according to God, what is the worst sin? Sins of commission or sins of omission? Omission, according to Matthew 25. I was hungry and you gave me no food. Get out of my sight. You condemned the everlasting fire. Prepared We're all the sitting devil's here angel. in omission right I now. I know, exactly. But rarely do people talk about how they don't take care of the poor, how they don't take care of others, how they didn't love people. And they only focus on, I had a dirty thought, Father. Okay, you need to be set free from that. And you need to be working on that. But you also start to need, are you focused only on yourself? Are you focused on God? Are you focused on his mercy? So some priest might be trying to help you, but if he says to you, like, let's say you miss mass on Sunday, and they say to you, and you did it on purpose, and the priest looks at you and says, well, that's not a sin. Well, that's not the truth. So you got to know that. So it all depends. But normally, if a priest tells you it's not a sin when it is a sin, I would go find another confessor. You understand? And I would just like to add on to that just yeah. a little bit. When I was in the seminary, there was a great priest in... He, you, he told us that he told the people in his parish, if a priest is ever mean to you in the confessional, <laughs> then just walk out. Mm. If you are going to confession and a priest is mean to you or yells at you, then just walk away. And they'll talk to the other priests about it. Someone actually walked out today. On my early confession CD, I said, didn't just say that. I said, Father, someone yells at you and you're really sorry. I say, say, Father, stop. Go to hell and walk on out. That's no longer on the CDs and that, but that was on the original ones. I would also suggest my life as a priest has been very much formed by, by letters that people have written me. Mm. In positive ways and in affirming ways, but also in ways where if, if you've gone to confession to a priest in, at, at another parish or you know who the priest is and he said your sins didn't count or they weren't big enough or why are you wasting my time? And, and I've heard all this as complaints from, from, sure. from the lay faithful. Write that priest a letter. Express the fact that that hurts because okay. that will change that priest for the rest of his life. I agree. But oftentimes we walk away, we complain about the priest or a lot of times you don't complain about the priest and thanks be to God for that. But... We're the body of Christ. And if, if we're going to grow, we have to grow in a very, very true sense by being go. sharpened by our brothers often. Last question, gentlemen, because we are okay. almost at time. Very good. Is uh, what brings you the greatest joy in being a priest and being Dr. Ray? 
Not well, having to share the stage with Father Larry. Oh, yeah. I can tell you the greatest joy for me is when someone comes to know Jesus and someone or goes to confession like if it's been 50 years or something. And, and that's, when, that's, that's always my thing that, okay, everything was worth me being a priest, everything. I get so excited when, you know, or someone says, Father, I came to know Jesus today. That's the only thing that matters because, again, that means you'll live forever if you just stay faithful. So I love, love hearing confessions. And I love bringing people to Christ. Similar. <laughs> Not so much confessions, but you know when people say, Dr. Ray, you've, you've pushed me back to the Catholic Church or something you said has made an impact in my life or we adopted kids because of you. Anything like that where somebody will tell me somehow, some way I was instrumental in their movement closer to God. Either that, either that or... Having three Reese's peanut butter cups, you know those big chocolate ones. I don't like peanut Either butter. That. Oh, okay. You like three? Okay. Good job, gentlemen. Let's give a round of applause uh, in Thanksgiving. That's it. No, no, standing ovation don't count if you got a priest doing this. That don't count. Tokenism. I want, to, uh, I want to ask a prayer of blessing upon our two brothers, asking, uh, they live a very, very challenging life, traveling and going here to there and back and forth, and, but they do it in the name of Christ, and they do it to inspire hearts. So I ask you all just to extend a hand with me as we ask God's blessing upon them. He can't really go. Gracious Lord, we ask your blessing upon Dr. Ray, upon Father Larry. We pray that you... Help them to be true instruments of your grace. Help their words, their preaching, their writing, their radio ministry to truly touch hearts. May their words that they speak fall upon soft ears. And may those ears transform hearts and hands for the sake of the gospel. Through the intercession of St. Joseph, through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and all the saints, Watch over them, bless them, and protect them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brothers. Thank you, Father. Thank you.